Praise the Lord. It is good for us to be able to get together and be able to look into the Word of God. I'm sorry that because of coronavirus and certain restrictions that we're having to revert back to um, online video teaching only for now. Uh, but I know that God is with us and things are going to turn out just fine. So let's get into the Word of God today. Judges chapter 15 and verse number 7. And Samson said unto the Philistines, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you. And after that I will cease. And then later in Judges 16 and 21 it says, But the Philistines took him, meaning Samson, and put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Today's message is blinding, binding, and grinding. Blinding, binding, and grinding. Let's pray. God, together we have gathered here once again, and I pray, Lord, that you reach out and minister to each one of us. Lord, let us examine our heart Look into our intentions, look into our motivations, look into our reactions, our behaviors, our feelings, our attitudes. And I pray, Lord, that you strengthen us and guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. This illustration of Samson after he was captured by the Philistines uh, shows the three different elements. Blinding. We're going to look at these scriptures again, but first of all, when the Philistines took him, they put out his eyes, they blinded him. Second, they bound him represented by these chains. Thirdly, he was hooked up to the grinding stone, and that's what this bar represents, that he held on to the grinding stone in his blindness and pushed the millstone to grind out the wheat. Matthew 18 and 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. And what we can gather from this is that when we live in this earth, we are going to get offended. People are going to do things that hurt us. And it doesn't always mean that they're intentional. Some are, some aren't. But offenses will come. It must needs be that offenses come. And what, he's, what the scripture is saying, what Jesus is talking about here, is that there's nothing that can be done to stop offenses from coming. They will come. You're going to experience them in life. And it's not always the offense that comes, but how we handle it, how we deal with it, that determines the outcome of our experience. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. And what he means by this also is that it, we're not supposed to look lightly if we offend others, or let's put it more distinctly, hurt others. The word offense or being offended is being used quite a bit nowadays. And it's really getting kind of become a little bit distorted. And they've taken the word offense and changed it from being where somebody is wounded or hurt because of poor behavior to anything that contradicts what I believe or think, anybody that says or acts different than that, I'm offended at that. Now that, when a person goes around saying, and you've heard me say this before, I'm offended, I'm offended at this, I'm offended at that, I'm offended at that. I usually see that and interpret it as, I am immature, I am immature, I am immature. Because people that are offended at the drop of a hat, if they're offended here and there on everything, 
that's really a sign of immaturity. But that's not the kind of offense this scripture is talking about. These scriptures that we're going to be studying are talking about legitimate wounds, hurts, afflictions, harm that comes to us and how we're going to deal with it. Now let's go back and look at these scriptures in Judges 15 and 7. And Samson said unto the Philistines, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. One of the uh, detriments of being offended is the desire for revenge. See, what happened to, Philist uh, excuse me, what happened to Samson is the Philistines had taken his wife and gave her to someone else, which you can kind of understand why Samson was upset. Now, Samson didn't deal with the situation exactly properly prior to this, and I don't want to get into all that. But I want you to see here is that when the Philistines took his wife and gave his wife to be the wife of someone else, can you imagine? He was offended. And what he said, I will get avenged. Uh, I will be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. Well, as we know, the life of Samson, yes, he was offended, and he got a he got revenge. He did a few different things. Well, first of all, all he took uh, foxes, tied their ta tails together, two foxes tied their tails together, and put uh, uh, a firebrand in between their tails and let them loose in the wheat fields. And he didn't just do one. I can't remember how many was, like 500 or something. I can't remember a huge number, 100 of them or something. So it caused quite havoc among the Philistines. And he said then he would cease, but he didn't cease. He kept on doing things against the Philistines. Because when a person seeks revenge, when the revenge is complete, they're never satisfied. And not only are they not satisfied with him, but the person of whom the revenge has been exercised on, then again in, in uh, uh, reciprocates that they want to get revenge back. And it just continues and continues and continues round and round. Now let's look at what happened, though, since Samson was offended and sought or wanted revenge. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes so that eventually it came down. They caught him. They got him. And the first thing they did was they put out his eyes, and then they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters, and he did grind in the prison house. I want you to see some things here about, and we're going to study these as uh, these different aspects. I've kind of highlighted three of them, um, but there's really four in this scripture. First of all, when a person is full of offense. They've been offended. They've been wounded. They've been hurt. Their vision is affected. And they may not even notice the change in their behavior, their disposition, their attitude, the way they interact with people. We're going to talk much more about it. But their eyesight, their vision, not their physical vision, but their spiritual and mental understanding is darkened. And it says it brought him down to Gaza. Next thing is that it brings us down. It brings us down. And the third thing is they bound him with fetters. When a person is full of offense, it binds them from the liberties and the freedoms and the joy that God has set forth for us to have. Just imagine for a second. This scripture talks about in Hebrews. Consider him that endured such great contradiction of sinners against himself. Talking in the book of Hebrews, talking about Jesus. If you consider things, all the things that Jesus endured, and he did nothing wrong. He was beaten, he was spit upon, he was lied on about, rumors were spread about him. Uh, many of his friends turned their back on him. Uh, and then, of course, the actual beating and crucifixion that took place. And what did he do? He could have called 10,000 legions of angels 
But it said, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did not let offense fetter him. He was still free. And the last thing that happens here is twofold. Samson was set to grinding. Well, what did that mean? Um, a lot of times the wheels, these big stone things, were set in the middle of a circular fashion. And a person would take a bar that was connected to the grinding wheel. And they walked around and around and around and around and around. And they get a lot of motion done, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of energy spent. But they don't get very far. And that's the next thing, is that when a person allows offense to reside in their heart, they'll go around and around and around, and they're stuck in a prison. They may see a lot of activity, a lot of emotion, a lot of, um, of, uh, a lot of times people even get, um, how do I, how do I say it? They, they become hypersensitive, but hyperactive at the same time. Well, partially because they're running from the bitterness that's in their heart. They're either, there's bitterness, some, some offenses don't cause bitterness, but most of them do. And they just go around and around in circles. We don't want to waste our life doing that. So let's go on. Resentment. Matthew 24 and 10, and they shall, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. There's three things that we can see in the scripture. Being offended is connected with resentment. Then they are going to have resentment. And betray one another. Why? Because of bitterness towards one another. And look at this last one. And shall hate one another, which we're going to connect to hostility, which is the natural progression. When a person is offended and they don't take care of it, it moves into resentment right away. And if they don't get it, then it will move into bitterness. And if they don't take care of it, then then hostility grows in their heart and hostility is often played out in action. There are never any positive consequences to retaliation, revenge, or resentment. Even if we get revenge, it never satisfies. It never takes away the pain. Really what happens, and uh, uh, this has been shown in studies, but um, people begin to become focused on the thing they resent. They get focused on it and they think about it and they think about it and think about it. And did you know, did you know they've seen, shown this in psychological studies, that when a person gets what they call fixated on something and they think it over and over and over again, even though they may have attitude against it, they may hate the thing, but since it continues to go round and around and around in their mind and in their heart, they actually create the brain to become the very thing that they were fixated on in hatred. We'll see this a little bit later. Overcome resentment by releasing offenses and regrets. And there's the, I put both of those in there about offenses and regrets. Now let's talk about regrets first. Is that sometimes we become resentful against ourselves for our bad behavior, bad choices. For the old saying, well, I should have known better. Or I, I knew better. We have to forgive ourselves. Even if you knew better. You're going to make mistakes in life. And if you feel like you need to punish yourself, that God wants you to punish yourself, 
you don't know God well enough yet because God doesn't want you to be punished. That doesn't mean he wants us to take our, our, our wrongs and our sins and stuff lightly, but he doesn't want us to beat ourselves over the head for the next six months, six years, six decades. So we have to forgive ourselves of our regrets. And then back to offenses. In the same manner, we have to forgive others for the offenses that they have done to us. Resentment, once allowed to remain within a person's soul, will grow until it pervades the entirety of one's character through bitterness. It begins in the justified reason for being resentful, but then it will grow unchecked into other regions of the heart. And this is one of the fears. And I've already kind of mentioned that when we think about it, we think about the, the well, let me read you this. It moves into bitterness. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let's take a look at this. He says, follow peace with men. And it says, and holiness. And we've talked about that many times. But let me throw this wholesomeness. You cannot be holy if your spirit is bitter. And so the way to do that is be at peace with people as best as we can, with all of the effort that we can. And even if people have offended us, and let me say, legitimately or illegitimately being offended, either way, we need to allow those things to pass from us, to forgive people, to let it go. Because without it, we're not going to see the Lord, and we're not going to see the Lord in eternity. But as I said before, your eyes will be put out, and you're not going to be able to see and perceive things spiritually properly. It'll be improper perceptions of things. And then it says looking. I think that's funny. It says, uh, follow men with peace and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. If we're not living as peace with people, we're not living a wholesome lifestyle. We're not going to be able to see the Lord. And then he says, look, <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Fail. How did they fail, fail God's grace? Because lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. How did they fail God's grace? Is that they allowed bitterness to come in and not allow the grace of God to conquer it. Because I know there's a misunderstanding. The word grace, a lot of people say it's the unmerited favor of God, which it is. But that's just like giving only half of a definition. It is the unmerited grace of God, but it is also the supernatural ability to do which we, that which we are incapable of doing under our own strength or power. So if we can't forgive under our own power, allow God's grace and mercy to give you the power. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, okay? Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Well, what kind of trouble? Well, when you have bitterness in your heart, you're going to have trouble on the left hand and on the right. You're going to never find contentment. You're going to find trouble at work, at home, in relationships, in friendships. Uh, the news that you read, the, the, the Facebook posts that you read, you're going to find trouble everywhere. And the bitterness is going to add to that. And it says, and thereby many be defiled, which means ruined. Their walk with God is ruined because it is like a cancer. It is growing. It is sending out tentacles, bitterness, and it moves and pervades into all regions of our heart, which means in all the different areas of our life. And some people, well, I can be better over here, but I'm not bitter over there. You're really being deceiving yourself because you're not seeing the taintedness that is spreading into the different regions. Acts chapter 8, but Peter said unto him, thy heart is not right in the sight of God. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Repent therefore and pray God 
if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven me. Lots of good things right there in that scripture. Is that Peter was explaining to this man's name was Simon. He said that his heart wasn't right. Why? Because he had bitterness in his heart. Well, it's a justified bitterness. No, it's not. Well, what was done to me was legitimately wrong. Very possible. Very true. But that doesn't make it right to keep bitterness in your heart. Because bitterness, like uh, I once heard somebody say, maybe it was talking about unforgiveness, bitterness. I don't know what it was. But it was something like this. Uh, keeping bitterness against somebody else is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. If you keep bitterness, it's only going to hurt your own heart. So we want to get rid of it. And it keeps us in a bond of iniquity. Because having uh, bitterness in our heart is sin. He says, repent, therefore. We're going to talk about that. And pray to God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And when it's talking about thought, it's not just talking about one vengeful action. But it is also talking about uh, those thoughts as in our disposition of our heart. The things that we have allowed. Um, another scripture says uh, something about... Um, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We've got to be careful what we let in our heart. And the devil knows that bitterness is one of the best things to overthrow our spirituality, our joy of the Lord, all those things. Not releasing by forgiving eventually leads to malicious thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors. As I already said, it will begin to grow like tentacles or like, like uh, the spreading of liquid through sand. It'll keep moving and moving and moving and pretty soon it'll saturate the whole heart. I want to talk about hostility, which is behaviors. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Meaning that you can't harbor bitterness and hostility in your heart and not expect to reap that from other people. I was thinking about a gentleman that I knew that uh, he had this job and he, he had to leave it because the manager and stuff was horrible. Terrible person. So I went to this other job, got a different job. And uh, you know what? That manager was a real jerk too. So he quit and he went and got another job. And another. And you know where that's going. You know, I understand that there are not great managers out there, but in some places. But if every place you work, the managers are horrible, it might be that it's not all them. Because what happens is when we have bitterness in our heart, pretty soon we begin to project it onto other people. Now, I'm not saying other people are perfect because nobody's perfect. We understand that. But we can begin to see things a lot worse in other places than they really are. And when we see it here and there and there and there and there and all around us, we need to take a look inside and see, wait a second. Could it be that bitterness and resentment and hostility have built up in my heart? And therefore, that's what I see everywhere. The street, three steps to get away from resentment, bitterness, and hostility. Repentance. Forgiveness. And kindness. These three are the mellow elements by which we can get resentment, bitterness, and hostility out of our hearts.
Let's focus on repentance first. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that their sins may be blotted out, when the times of oppression shall come from the presence of the Lord. Awesome scripture. See, repentance is first focusing on us. We need to go to God and say, God, well, another scripture says, let a man so examine himself and see whether he be in the faith. Take a look and say, I have bitterness in my heart. Please forgive me. Help me remove this. Help me to turn from these thoughts and ways. Move in my heart. Change me. Help me, God. Repentance. And it says, says, repent ye therefore and be converted. When a person repents, there will be a change in them. It takes a while sometimes, but a change begins. Sometimes it goes quick. Sometimes it takes a little while. That your sins may be blotted out so he can remove that out. And look at what happens when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When a person repents, it is so refreshing. It is so renewing. It is so filling and blessing. It feels wonderful to repent. You feel so clean and so cleaned out. Amen. Mayo Clinic, an article that I read, Forgiveness, Letting Go of Grudges and Bitterness, said this, Forgiveness means different things to different people. Generally, however, it involves a decision to let go of resentment and thoughts of revenge. The act that hurt or offended you might always be with you, but forgiveness can lessen its grip and help free you from the control of the person who harmed you. See, forgiveness helps to set you free. That's why repentance comes first. God, forgive me. I'm sorry for what I've done. Now help me to forgive them so that they cannot influence me anymore from their behavior, their words, their behaviors, their actions. Forgiveness can even lead to feelings of understanding, empathy, and compassion for the one who hurt you. Sometimes forgiveness helps us to see things in a clearer light of the situation. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done. And let me put it that way, excusing it or even endorsing it, okay? Doesn't mean that when I forgive, doesn't mean I endorse or accept the poor behavior. It just means that I'm not going to hold it against them anymore. I am putting all the judgment in God's hands. God's in control of it now. He can take care of it the way he feels best. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done to you or making up with the person who caused the harm. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation if the person is still dangerous. Forgiveness doesn't mean, okay, now I'm all going to forget that that happened. Well, no, you got to use some sense. If they hurt you and they, they have not repented, then it's very possible they will hurt you again. So we have to be precautious. We got to be sensible. We got to be wise. Forgiveness brings the kind of peace that you that helps you go on with life. And I love that. When we forgive, it sets us free. It's like laying down the weight of the pain and the, and the agony that has been troubling you or harassing you when you forgive. Now, forgiveness isn't necessarily easy. It's a choice. Well, I don't feel like I forgave him. It's a decision. It takes sometimes a while for your emotions to catch up. It's nice when it works right away, but that is not the norm. Sometimes it's forgiveness is a choice. And when the bad feelings keep coming, you just combat the bad feelings. You're saying, I forgave them. I will not hold resentments against them anymore. I'm not going to be bitter, and I do not want your revenge through hostility. I'm letting God have it. 
The second one, of course, is forgiveness, which we already begin to talk. But look at this. Oh, we, the second one is forgiveness. We've been talking about it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby by ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Well, what, what grieves the Holy Spirit? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking but put away from you with all malice, which is hostility. Those are the things that grieve the spirit. It's hard to be in the flow of the Holy Ghost and in the joy of the Lord and peace that passes all understanding when we're full of bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and malice. I have noticed that people on Facebook that are bitter and their comments are constantly upon the same line. They're either talking bad about people, talking bad about situations over and over and over and over again. They need to cut away because they are fixated, as I talked about before. They haven't forgiven, which means they haven't repented. You have to repent before you can forgive. And look for the third thing, the resolution is kindness. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Once a person has forgiven, they need to demonstrate kindness. Kindness to the person that had offended them, that person that had hurt them. Now, understand, if it's unsafe, you have to keep a distance. That's just the way it is. And I mean unsafe physically you also don't have to submit yourself repeatedly to verbal and emotional abuse and of course definitely not physical abuse and so that's not what we're talking about but we can treat them kindly if people come and say i i heard you have had problems with brother so-and-so too what you're going to do is not collaborate with them but you're going to be kind and say things like, uh, we may have had our troubles, but we have forgiven one another. And I wish brother so-and-so well. I want nothing but goodness to happen for him in his life. Kindness. And sometimes if it's smaller infractions, maybe you've got some bitterness and some animosity against somebody in the church or one of your family members. The Bible talks about, and I thought about putting the scripture in here, about if you go to the altar and to present your gift to the Lord and you remember that your brother has ought against you, go to your brother. How can you do that? Well, if they have offended you, you forgive them and you be kind to them. If you have offended them, you go and you ask for their forgiveness. And it is solidified. It is strengthened. It is even more liberating and takes it to the next level. When you are so transformed and strengthened through the forgiveness process, that you're able to extend kindness to the person who has offended you. Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21, kind of gives an overview of this whole concept of escaping being blinded, binded, and grinding. Verse number 14, bless them which persecute you. What's that? Be kind. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Now, why would he put that in there? <laughs> because we're dealing with bitterness, resentment, hostility. First, we're going to bless them that have not treated us right. The next thing it says, rejoice with them that do rejoice. Maybe there's a, a, there's a seed of jealousy. We should be excited for them. Now, sometimes we're jealous against people, and they have no idea why. Rejoice with other people if they get a promotion, if they get a position, if they get a blessing, if they get a financial blessing or, or you know, whatever it may be. Something good comes our way. Rejoice with them. Be happy for them and weep with them that weep. 
what is he dealing with? He's saying, don't rejoice when evil came upon the person that hurt you or that you were, if, if things didn't turn out well for those people that you were jealous against. No, we need to feel bad for them when bad things happen. Number 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. What he's saying here, and I'm just going to put it in this context, or in these words, according to the context that we're looking at it, is this. Don't think you're so smart that you can get away with jealousy, resentment, and bitterness. Even if the person has done poor, bad behavior towards you, you can't let that lift you up. You still need to be kind and compassionate. Number 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, and if possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. We already read about that. Supposed to be impure. Uh, have peace and holiness with all men without which no man shall see the Lord and don't let a root of bitterness get in you let me say something if you're in church and there is somebody else that you've got a position or an opportunity or whatever and maybe you wanted that opportunity maybe you wanted to do what they got to do maybe you wanted to have the opportunity that they got and you didn't get it, one of the best things to do is back that person up. Help them. Volunteer. Be with them. Why? Because that's kindness. What's first? Repentance, forgiveness, kindness. Number 19. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourself. And there it is. We cannot hold hostility. We cannot want revenge. We have to leave things in God's hands. But rather give place, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will pay, saith the Lord. What's that mean? If somebody has offended you, if somebody has done legitimately something bad against you, when it says give place to, to wrath, what that means is leave it in God's hands. Let him take care of it. Understand if you try to take care of it, uh, you may not have the power to accomplish, but God knows how to judge things righteously and properly. He knows justice. He knows how to look at things in the right um, perception of things. He understands it all. And so leave it in his hands. Give him the place. Here, God, I'm let you be in charge. If you think that there needs to be some wrath or some vengeance or some repayment for what has happened to me, it's yours. Me, I'm letting it go because I don't want to be bogged down with hatred, with resentment, with bitterness. I don't want to hold control of hostility. All those things hurt my spirit. They squinch my heart. They grieve the Holy Ghost. And I don't want to live with that. Here, it's yours, Jesus. You take it. Verses 20 and 21. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. What's that? Kindness. If he thirsts, give him drink. Kindness. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. In verse number 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I've always looked at the scripture, and rightly so, that uh, if people have treated you poorly, just keep being kind, keep forgiving them. Don't be resentful, just be good, be kind, be kind, be kind, be kind. But something else new that I saw is that it will overcome the evil in your heart by doing good too. Being kind to someone that has mistreated you shows strength and victory and builds you up spiritually 
as I used to say, you're a bit, much better man than that. Meaning, you're living above where you should have been pushed down to. And our last scripture, Titus 3, verses 3 and 4. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, which is hostility and envy, which is jealousy. Living in malice, hostility, and jealousy. Being hateful and hating one another. But after that, after we got free, after we got fixed, after we got filled, after we repented and forgave. But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man. And that's what we want to aim at. If you have hostility, bitterness, or resentment, we want to move to, to the place where we can show kindness. And last of all, the love of God. When you can show the love of God to someone who has offended you, you have shown the incredible power of God in your life. I absolutely love that. When you can love those that are not loving you. So now you can see the steps of deliverance and what great outcome can come outcome can come at the end. First of all, you can repent about your poor attitude, your wrong attitude. Then you can forgive them by God's grace and his help. And then also by God's grace and help, you can show kindness. And when you do those three, somewhere along the line, something godly and spiritual will happen. And you'll be able to demonstrate and express the love of God to someone that doesn't deserve it. And that is my goal for every one of us. Let's pray. Jesus, right now, as we've seen the scriptures, we've read these things, God. I pray, Lord, that if there be anybody that's got hostility or bitterness or resentfulness or jealousy. God, I pray that you just move in our hearts and our minds and bind us up and, and help us, Lord, first of all, to repent. That we let the circumstances, the events, the offenses get into our heart. Forgive us for letting those things get into our heart and help us to change them. And then, Lord, we ask that you help us to forgive. We declare it today. Right now, we declare the very thing that we were offended by and, been, uh, and are resentful for. We declare it, God, to you, and we hand it over to you. We say right now, we promise we're forgiving those people and help us to forgive. And then, God, if life and circumstances allow, help us to express kindness to those people through your grace, your mercy, and your love. Help us to be kind to them. And as we go through this process, we know and believe that the Holy Ghost in us will release us. And soon we will be able to develop true love through the love of God for those people that have been against us. We pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Go out there and have great victory.